and uh, good to see you all aboard just in time. Uh, you may have noticed that uh, the tide is going a uh, down, and so as a uh, navigation uh, professional, I'm always watching the tide and watching the bridges, and I think we're just going to squeak by. Uh, but I, I worked on the Yangtze River in China for many years, and uh, our fleet of ships there we always said, oh, the ocean's easy, a river is difficult. And I hope, but I'm sure we'll be out and on our way onto our next ports uh, forthwith. Uh, and so uh, we've come down from, well, we'll have another day in France, and then we are in the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, and I'm going to start because we're gonna first going to go to um, Bilbao in Spain. And I put up the Spanish flag as a familiar flag, of course, but it, uh, I, I was intrigued by the, the emblem, which has uh, <coughs> Galicia, Leon, Castilla, and Catalonia. And this is, um, let's say, a unified nation by force after many, many wars and conflicts. And so France is a discontented nation, but it's had nowhere near the trouble of Spain, even now, where Catalonia is voting on its own independence. Uh, uh, Galicia would like to be an independent nation. The Basque area where we're visiting in a couple of days also wants to be away from the grip of Madrid, which uh, is exemplified by the, the wrappings on the columns and the, co and the uh, motto plus ultra, as if they try to make the great empire state of Spain out of disparate regions in their own land, and then of course they went around the world. And uh, in Portugal, it could be said, is one of the um, disparate members of the Iberian community, because it did fight and win its independence from Madrid and the, the royal families as they uh, battled over the centuries. And so the Portuguese are particularly proud that they are independent of Spain. And I'll show you the ports we're going, but uh, having been in Spain and Portugal numerous times, I always remember a Portuguese friend when asked, why is Portuguese so different from, uh, let's say, Castilian? And they said, well, we were down on the sea and they were up in the dry lands riding horses, shouting at everybody. We were quietly speaking amongst ourselves and we changed our pronunciation over centuries so those Spaniards couldn't understand what we're talking about. So, well, that's a maybe just a local explanation for it, but um, Spain, of course, does have all these different ports and different coasts. So this is on the North Atlantic. This is uh, Bilbao, which uh, faces north on the uh, uh, northern shore into the North Atlantic. And of course, there are other sport, uh, port in Cadiz facing uh, to the west down south of Portugal, and then all of the Mediterranean ports, which we will continue on our way to. But uh, Bilbao was a, uh, a city that was built, um, well, it goes back into, again, prehistory with Celtic peoples and then the Romans and then various immigrants from other parts of Spain. But in modern times it became a large industrial city because of uh, iron ore and they had uh, mines in the back country and then they had uh, ore operations and then they made a wealthy city on exporting their ore and finished iron to the rest of Europe a couple of hundred years ago and then by the end of the 1800s it was pretty much exhausted and then they uh, became a poor city and actually were somewhat depopulated. And in the recent uh, 50 years, it's uh, turned to into a financial center and then uh, services, uh, and, uh, but above all, the new art museum there. So it's become a cultural center, much to the surprise of some of the old residents. And now it's a mod moderate sized city, it's maybe 300,000 people, uh, very convenient from the port. And it has an old district, but it, this, this overview, you can see the the new Guggenheim Museum right there. And that's uh, sort of the hallmark of the city now. This is the city flag and the regional emblem. And, and that symbol is called a Luturu, which is a Basque symbol of infinity. And uh, it's not actually on the flag, but I found it and just thought it's a curiously, well, they say it's Basque. It actually may go back into Celtic times because they, if you were in, so in San Malo, they have a similar symbol of their Celtic past. This is the city symbol itself built around the, the river and uh, the, the crown. Of course, it has been uh, now part of the uh, kingdom of Spain now that the monarchy has been restored. Uh, this is the earliest drawing of the city, which uh, shows it walled on the banks of the river uh, and the uh, hills behind and some fortifications. 
And then in the center of the city was a, what they call the Seven Streets in Basque, which was the, the trading center in the old city, uh, which remains to this day as what they call the uh, uh, Casco Viejo in, in Spanish. And so then behind it is the modern city. So like, like a lot of these cities we go to, they have fortunately preserved their old towns. Uh, but a lot of it was destroyed during uh, the Carlist Wars and then the Peninsular Campaign in the early 1800s. Now, the Carlist Campaign was when the northern cities rebelled against uh, Charles VI, and uh, they had a civil war whether they were going to become a republic or maintain a monarchy. Well, the, the, the monarchists won in that case. Uh, this was the Battle of Luchana in about 1805. And then... Um, Thereafter, with peace, the city began to expand, and it, 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 the industrial area is down further down the river, and the Casco Viejo is in the other bank. Um, but it's become a you know very pleasant city built around the around the small river that runs into the sea. This is one of the universities uh, up the river, and so it's not a major metropolitan area, but it is uh, very proud of its heritage and particularly its language. It is a Basque-speaking city, and Spanish is everywhere. But uh, you'll hear all the what it, what is the incomprehensible Basque language to the, uh, those of us who have not had the opportunity to live there or study it? Um, this is one of the old bank buildings, and they they have a sort of a very florid, uh, late, uh, I would say almost a grand empire style to some of the traditional buildings. Uh, we are going to be getting there just before this uh, annual festa or a big celebration starts to happen. It's uh, in the Spanish is called the Gran Semana, which means the big week of partying on the street. And this is the effigy up there is a big puppet of what they call uh, uh, Marijua, which is the mother of the Basque people. And so they animate her and cheer the crowds on as they have uh, floats and parades. We may see some of that in preparation, but it's not starting until next week. So then the modern city built out with uh, Again, freighting and uh, industrial areas. Uh, and uh, it had been damaged during the Civil War, though. Some of these areas were, the old part of town, were bombed by German airplanes helping the, uh, the nationalists of the Franco forces suppress the rebellions in the various cities. So Bilbao, like Barcelona, was, had areas that were damaged. And of course, nearby is Guernica, the famous site of the, the, the first aerial bombing of civilians. This is a park overlooking the town, and uh, the, that's a chimney from an old smelt. They had a mine up in the mountains, and then they would smelt the ore right there in the mountains, and that is a, a rec reclaimed mining area that is uh, in the mountains right above the city. And then downtown, you have all these uh, modern buildings. Here's the uh, Torre Ibadola and uh, other modernist uh, buildings. So this is the well, you can have your own opinion, but I feel like the, the, the new construction, of particularly glass boxes, is it will be an era much regretted in architecture because it just is the same wherever you go. You get a big glass box. And an architect t told me when you get these kind of laments, why are the old buildings so beautifully made and the new ones are just a big mirror? Well, the, the economy has made what was traditionally where you had expensive materials like stone and metals and things would come from afar. It cost a lot to get to the site, but the labor was very inexpensive 100, 200, 300 years ago. Now it's the opposite. An architect can order rel relatively inexpensive materials from anywhere, and then the labor is expensive. So that's why there's been a constant tendency to make modern architecture as plain as they can afford because of the cost of labor. Of course, the, there are other reasons for it, just technology. So here's a one of the metro stations in downtown uh, Bilbao, which, again, is a, one of the more attractive pieces of steel and glass. But uh, then they have a new stadium, uh, the San Mames. And so you, you get in these cities this delicious combination of the old and the new, again, along the river. Here's the, one of the football stadiums. And the airport, this was designed by Calatrava, the, the great uh, Valencian Spanish uh, architect who has been building these sweeping, uh, almost unimaginable buildings. You, you wonder how it can stand up, but of course he was an engineer before he became an architect and considers himself more of a sculptor than even a standard archi uh, architect. And so this is an example of which there are many around Spain. And then of course we have the great museum, which is a curious tale because Bilbao actually requested and bid on this uh, construction of this 
branch of the original Guggenheim Museum in New York. And now this is more famous than the one in New York, uh, which was itself an architectural landmark built in the 1930s. But this is an example of, uh, oh, what we could call uh, unimaginable construction because it looks like it's, uh, oh, something floating away uh, in the air. And it has sculpture around the uh, outside, again, set on the, on the riverbank. Um, but there will be a tour there, or you can just go from the ship and go in, into the museum, see what their current show is. Uh, some people have said, well, these are museums that are best seen from the outside, because on the inside, often the exhibition rooms, because of the nature of the construction, are very small, or else they may be very high. But it's not your standard, uh, uh, let's say, interior museum that has more space for more work or galleries. Often the interiors here are spectacular, but it's more about the building than what they're exhibiting sometimes. But you can go see for yourself. Now next we go on to Galicia, which is the northwestern tip of Spain. Um, this is its flag again with the, the royal symbol back again. And uh, then we're going to go to La Coruña, which is up on the coast and is a, a city that's been built upon a promontory overlooking the sea. And it has, again, a long history of peoples coming in some battles, and uh, now it is a smaller town than Bilbao. But this is the point of land looking out. And, and curiously, you see this compass rose there. It has Celtic symbols, because the, the, the legend in Galicia is that they were the uh, source of the Celts in the British Isles in Ireland. And so they are proud of that heritage. Now, again, I, if I, I put up these symbols, which are, uh, I'm sure this is, someone can interpret them better, but uh, this is the Tower of Hercules, which is the giant uh, lighthouse right on the tip of La Coronia, which is, a, of course, a major landmark for ships coming in to, to sea. And this is the landmark, which is said to have been built upon a fire tower of the Celtic people some 2,000 years ago. So even when the Romans came, they noted that there was a lighthouse here. And it has uh, around the grounds of it, um, well, here's an anchor that's said to have come from the Aegean. But uh, they have particularly this statue of King uh, Borgon, who was the Celtic king of about tw uh, 20, 2,500 years ago. This goes way back in uh, almost prehistory for Europe. And it was he who was said to have mounted up onto the Celtic lighthouse. And with his supernatural vision, he could see Ireland. And then he said, we're going to get our boats and go there. And so this is the pride of uh, La Coruña, that they have a deeper hi history, even more than their Latin culture now. All along the coast here, there are uh, monoliths of uh, dolmens, like this, uh, sort of like a local stone hedge. But uh, those sort of monuments go all the way from uh, Galicia up to Brittany, then to the British Isles and Ireland, and, and perhaps beyond. They can find some in Iceland, some people say. But uh, noted, noted they all have a cut in them, which I believe um, was added later. These are the original fortifications for La Coruña, which are, again, Celtic. They were uh, armed encampments on this peninsula overlooking the sea. Now it has been built up with, uh, say, Spanish-style fortifications back through the more recent troubles of uh, of uh, the century. So this uh, illustration was actually a mosaic uh, up there on the, the Tower of Hercules uh, is a illustration of the um, peninsula ca campaign when the French had invaded Spain and the British army came in under Wellington and they had landed and taken Galicia but they were actually driven out here and so they had a battle before the evacuation. Of course later Wellington won and allied with Portugal guaranteed Portuguese independence. So. And here's a monument to one of the, uh, the local military heroes, again, like we saw here in Bordeaux, these fantastic, triumphant uh, monuments of the uh, troubles of the past. But we'll be going into a newer port. This is the old port, which is much more contained. And actually, it looks very much like Marseille with all of the, the buildings right around the old port in the secluded waters. And then there are beaches all around La Coruña. This is the, the Playa de Resor. And We'll see the same thing as we saw, uh, well, not, not in Bordeaux, but Saint-Malo. Everybody's at the beach these, this time of year. The rest of the year, they're in the football stadium. So Galicia and the Basques are, like much of the world, uh, mad for football. And so this is the, the team from La Coruña, which is a major contester in the um, Spanish league. And then as we go around the coast, uh, we, there's a Cape uh, Finisterre, the end of the 
land, it's called. And it's a landmark for navigators who are coming from the north to get to the Mediterranean. You always have to steer wide and clear of that particular cape because many a ship has been has foundered and been lost right there. And the coast is very, very rough all the way down around Galicia. Uh, they are a people of the sea, though, and famous sailors and uh, have fishing fleets and things like this. But uh, it's because they have the fresh Atlantic wind on them all the time. Now we're going to go around to Portugal. This is one of the lighthouses coming up into um, Oporto. Now, it's usually called Porto, which is uh, uh, where they get the name of uh, Portugal. So it actually goes back to Latin times. But the, um, the name of the city is uh, Oporto when you say in uh, Portuguese because the, the O means the port. And this was the original port of, in ancient times for Portugal. Uh, and it is on the ri River Douro. Now you can see it up on the top uh, there in Porto, and then the town of Oporto. That's the purple up there in the top of Portugal. Uh, and then the rest of the provinces in Lisbon is down to the south, and the Algarve is down on the very far south. We will be going to uh, Portimao uh, after we leave Lisbon. But this is a small country, but with a, a great deal of pride and uh, a, a particularly a tradition of exploration. And so out of these little provinces and uh, ports, the Portuguese went all the way around the world and set up their own colonies and uh, establishments uh, from the African colonies to India, Goa, then to Malacca, Malaysia, then to um, Macau, China, which was just returned to China after all these years. And they also had a port in uh, Nagasaki. And so the, the small country had sent its uh, sailors all over the world and uh, as um, uh, Zhao Yenis once said, we, are, we have a small country to be born in, but we have a great world to die in. And uh, part of the Portuguese personality um, sort of contains a, a great deal of nostalgia and then uh, sadness because so many young men would go off to sea and never come back, whether they were fishing or they went off as conquerors around the world. So uh, typical in uh, Portuguese music is a lament for the lost sailors and the lost sons. And the women were, were at home and minding their taking care of home, but uh, often were, for the rest of their lives, grieving for their lost sons. And this is very different from the Spanish who were riding around on their horses and, and only some went to sea. Uh, but that is a, a, a cultural difference that Portugal is a maritime nation and S Spain is largely uh, interior territory and uh, of course it has coasts, but it doesn't have that, s that same kind of uh, sense. Well, this is Porto on the River Douro, just an illustration that the old town is uh, now surrounded by na modern suburbs and highways and things like this. But this is Ribera, which is the north bank of, of uh, the Douro River with this bridge that was actually built by, um, under the design of Gustav Eiffel, who built the Eiffel Tower. Uh, they had previously had pontoon bridges across the river made out of old wine casks. And so this, this uh, small river had rickety pontoons to get across. And famously, when the French troops invaded uh, uh, under Napoleon, uh, they were sacking the north part of the city. And all the people came and fled onto the pontoon bridge. And it collapsed and lost thousands in this river. Now they don't allow that, uh, pontoons. But then across the other side is what they call a Gaia, Nova Ville de Gaia, which is the new town. And that uh, traditionally was where they, they stored all the port wine to, for shipment out of uh, Portugal. And so now it, you can see, it, like uh, in Bordeaux, there's a you know, rising little modern city all around the old city. But the D River Douro is a very tranquil river, but it goes far into the countryside. It's navigable uh, a few hundred kilometers up into the higher hills that separate Portugal from Spain. And it uh, always had these uh, sailboats that would be carrying the, the port wine down to the s town of Porto to be exported. And they still have some. This is the beautiful uh, Azuelo blue tile that Portugal is famous for. And you'll see all over the place. But the city itself was wealthy because of the export of wine. And it's not unlike Bordeaux that way. And so they, they have a, let's say, late 1800s, very elaborate buildings like this on the uh, Avenida Aliados. And then there's the Camara Municipal, which is the, the uh, government office on the center of the town. And outside of the, this is up above the riverbanks. But um, if you do nothing else, it's good to just go and walk around the old town and see the, the, the beauty of the 
buildings there. Again, it has an old cathedral that dates to, um, actually back to Roman times. It was a Roman temple before it came a, a uh, Catholic cathedral, which remains to stay. It's fairly plain. It dates from about 1100. And uh, other buildings are more modern, like this uh, train station. So. Um, and it, this is not a very big city, but you get around on a, on a tram again. I don't know if you took the tram today in Bordeaux, but that's pretty modern. You can go on a, a good old style one. These are actually imported from the United States back in the late 1800s uh, before highways took over. And so locally they used to call it, uh, you'd, you'd take an Americano to go on a tram around town. And they still have a few as a museum piece, but that's the modern way. And uh, so again, that goes over the bridge from back, back and forth. We'll be docking further down, not right downtown, like we had the pleasure of docking today. And then near the, above Ribeiro, a, um, uh, a Florentine architect was asked to design a tower, a lighthouse tower behind the, uh, the church. So this is a landmark of the city, the Torre de Cliergos, uh, the, the tower for the clergy of the church. And here's the cathedral up to the left, and then this is the entrance way into the Ribera district with all the small streets and old houses and uh, cafes and such. So uh, it, particularly in the evening, the whole city is uh, busy with its uh, cafe lifestyle. And uh, it's very animated. I, mean, I, I find that the Portuguese are more uh, expressive, warmer, and uh, in this case, even with a band of clowns uh, playing on the street. You don't find that in Madrid. Everybody's so serious there. And so I'm going to pay you a little Portuguese music when I'm done, but um, I'm going to go on just with some of the sites. This is the, uh, the new uh, conservatory of music, which is designed by the Dutch uh, architect Kulhas. And that's just opened uh, less than 10 years ago. And then in a park uh, out on the shore, lower in the Douro, is this fantastic sculpture by uh, American artist Janet Eckhart, uh, which is suspended on a great... Um, tower and then guide around, but it, it is constantly moving in the wind. And that, if you go, if you have the time to go down to, it's called um, Minicientos, the, the, the area toward the beach, toward the ocean, where they have this particular site, and a, a new modern piece. Otherwise, again, we have more classical architecture, like this uh, uh, walkway uh, out on the beach, in the, it's called Foz de Douro. That's the, uh, the, the opening of the, of the river to the sea. But I saw that there are tours up into the wine country, up the Douro. And these were the boats that they still have, uh, mostly for show and advertising, to, uh, for their brands of uh, port wine. Now, port wine, the, the quality of it is, is that it is, uh, they call a uh, enhanced wine, that they put brandy into the wine so they can travel. Because one of the problems prior to pasteurization and other bottling techniques is wine could not travel, it would go sour very quickly. And particularly for shipping to England, which was the, the largest market for port wine to, to this day perhaps, uh, they add a bit of brandy and that would keep the, the wine safe for travel. Of course it makes it then turns sweet and it's a little thicker than let's say a fresher wine or un, unfortified wine. But these are the houses that have this great estates up into the mountains and you can go see one. Uh, I went up there a few years ago up into the countryside to see them and every bend of the river has a classical Portuguese town where the wines would come down to the river to be loaded on those boats to go down to the, 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 the bigger port. And these are, oh, uh, sort of mountainside villages and with their church and market right on the river and then it goes up into the hills where they have the viniculture. And so a, a river cruise up there is sort of a journey up into the, uh, the deeper wine country. You now this is, you can see them coming up the hill and on one mountain, this figure is probably, oh, you know, 30 meters high or so. This is the Sandman Estates and of course that's a famous brand of uh, port wine. So if you haven't had enough wine yet, you can go up and, and have more. Uh, and there's varieties of uh, Portuguese wine, particularly you, my favorite is the Vino Verde, which is the fresh white wine that has a little bit of carbonation to it. It's very refreshing in the summer. But uh, if you go, you'll get your explanation from the Vintier and the, uh, the hosts of, of the uh, chateau or the houses of wine up there. And then curiously, also outside of Porto is the world, is the Europe's largest synagogue, which um, after the Jews had been driven out of Spain and Portugal, um, the Cadori family, 
who were Sephardic Jews, and they were based in China as refugees, made a fortune, and came back and built this as a statement of, of redress of grievances. And you may have read in the paper that Spain has now apologized officially for the expulsion of the Jews in 1492 under Ferdinand and Isabel, and is offering citizenship for anyone who wants to come back to their ancestral land. Uh, but I don't know whether they will. That's a bit of history. So then we have Lisbon, which is the, big, the major city and capital of Portugal. Um, prior to uh, the Reconquista, or the driving of the Moors and the uh, is Islamic forces out of all of uh, the Iberian Peninsula, the Portuguese were in the north, and they had to have over 100 years of battles to come down to where Lisbon was which had uh, large fortifications and palaces for the, uh, the Moorish uh, rulers of the land. Uh, and so Lisbon was actually retaken and then that was proclaimed a capital um, by uh, the King Alfonso Hernández. Uh, it is on the, uh, the, uh, the ri uh, river uh, Tejo, or, or Taugus in English we call it, which is a broad estuary that goes up into, up into the hills later. But once you get, come past the, uh, the entrance to the harbor, the city's right on the lee side of the ocean, so it's a safe harbor, anchorage and harbor, and that's why it became a major port. But the city itself had been um, founded, again in prehistoric times, supposedly by Hercules himself, but the city was named after Ulysses, and in, in Old Greek uh, it would be Lisbo, which became Lisbon. So the name came from Greek to Roman to Portuguese, named after the mythical founder of it, Hercules, who had just come out through the uh, gate, uh, the uh, Gibraltar and the gate to the Mediterranean. So it's actually the oldest national capital in all of Europe. And it was a s large town for the time before Paris was established, or much less Madrid. So it is a very, again, um, a, a ocean port. It has beautiful beaches and resorts on the west side. You see Casais and uh, Cinta, where the royal family had its summer palaces and then other beaches, and of course if you've been down to the Algarve, uh, the southern Portugal is particularly charming because it has nice tranquil beaches that are fairly uh, free from the pounding of the ocean like in the north. So here's the city seal of Lisbon. It's a muy nobre e sempre leal cidade do Lisboa. Uh, so it says uh, always, um, um, let's say, noble and then legal as the city. And so as a capital, of course, it has to be. There it is again. And so it has, I still don't understand why there are two big crows sitting on the ship. I guess all the sailors were on the, at the beach. But uh, this is the center of Lisbon. I'm sure many of you have already been there, the uh, ca castle of uh, St. George, uh, um, and this again goes back to medieval times. It had previously been a Moorish castle before the Reconquista. And you can go up from the center, or we'll be docking further below, but. You can, you, uh, you can hike it if you really want, but it's pretty steep, especially crawling over the walls with a good view of the whole river and everything. But those are medieval embattlements and they have the neighborhoods that kind of crawled up to the edge of it's now all open to the public as a park. But again, Lisbon goes back so far that uh, they have in the last decade found Phoenician ruins under the cathedral. So they have a lot of these places we're going, they're still finding the past, and particularly even deeper past. These are the city walls back during the Visigoth time, after they had came and, and took all of the Iberian Peninsula away from the Romans, and then they built their own city walls around. So those are now walkways up into the castle area. So this was King Alfonso Henriquez, who led the battles to claim Portugal for the Christians and then establish again Lisbon as the capital. This is the remains of the Moorish capital. It's actually out near Sinta. There was the very large fortifications again conquered by the northern Portuguese forces and then uh, kept to this day as a historical ruin. 1147 was the date when the formal surrender of the Moors left. Of course uh, it took longer in Spain and that whole history kind of encouraged a martial attitude, both in Spain and Portugal, which goes on to this day. They had all kinds of battles between different noble families, and then the Spanish came and were always trying to assert their authority over Portugal. They finally did it in 1680 by intermarrying the family. But meanwhile, this is one of the battles for Lisbon in 1384. Um, 
and you will see on the streets uh, this uh, national symbol of Portugal, which is just a little rooster. And the story goes is that the Spanish had come down, not in Lisbon, but for, uh, in central country, and they'd captured a Portuguese a commander, and they summoned him to say, why, sh why shouldn't we um, execute you right now? And he said, because I'm representing the spirit of our people. And the... Um, the Spanish commander said, well, we'll have a final banquet with you before we execute you at dawn in front of your troops, unless you, unless you have some miracle to perform. And uh, uh, at the dinner table, a, a rooster was served. Um, the story goes that it was already cooked, but it got up and cried freedom and ran out the dinner table. So the story goes. But ever since then, they made this as a symbol of the country of its independence. Well, it's as usual, it's a believe it or else, but uh, you'll see that around. But this martial spirit of the Portuguese, of course, was led them to the great empire around the world. And uh, here's just a tableau of the different knights of the past coming down to the current military guard. Notice how the, how the, uh, the, the uniforms have gotten simplified, but I think the horses are relieved. And there's still the color guard and the, you know, the, some military left of the Portuguese, but that's a, a long story, let's say, of fighting and then making peace. Here's Lisbon in the early 1500s. And you can note the, well, the wall city and the castle up on the top. And then these are trading ships from the Mediterranean or, the, uh, or North Africa, actually, with that uh, Latin-style rig. And that was uh, in the history of navigation, when the Arabic style of Latin rig mixed with the deep hulls of the northern-style ships, they made the modern uh, caravel that carried the Portuguese around the world. Um, so this is the more early 1500s, a view, a view of the waterfront in Lisbon with a truly seaworthy vessels that were deep hull, heavy, they could carry a lot of provisions, and those innovations meant that the Portuguese could travel all the way around Africa and go to Asia at the beginning of the age of exploration. But back at home in Lisbon, just when they were getting enriched by their trade around the world, um, well, the, the reason why they went so far is that they were at the end of the trade routes of the Mediterranean. So whatever they wanted from the Middle East or Asia, they had to go through so many middlemen. So they built these caravels that could travel for months on end at sea, not need a provision. And so it made Lisbon the most prosperous capital in, in Europe um, in the 14th, 15th, 16th century. And they were outpacing the Spanish at that point, of course. Uh, so some of the districts date from there. This is the Alfama, which is, uh, again, an Arabic word for the hill, means. And they had put, let's say, the Catholic cathedral and other churches up top. But this is a medieval uh, quarter of Lisbon, which um, is, has lots of little lanes and staircases. You may have been there. This is really the heart of the, the old town of Lisbon. And uh, the castle is up off the screen to the left. But it's, if, if you want, it's worth a, a half a day hike just through this neighborhood because uh, it's, it's famous for its uh, small restaurants and uh, fado music. Here it is, this uh, um, tight little medieval neighborhood. Uh, much of it in disres uh, disrepair these days, and, which is unfortunate. Uh, but you see the, the building to the uh, left-hand side, it, it has the uh, tile work on the exterior. And that's a famous feature in Portugal. The, this one's not blue, but it's the same kind of Azuelo painted tiles, which are a mark of uh, distinction for a house. And uh, you know, Lisbon has very packed neighborhoods up on the hills and little tramways that go up. And it's a very charming city, particularly because you can always go up higher and get a view of the rest of the city, unlike in Bordeaux. So here's the fado, which is the lament, literally. And it's a style of music that uh, was developed in Lisbon in particular, uh, of women singing because they've lost their mate or their son off to war or off to sea. And so the, there are little cafes all through um, Alfama, which still continue this tradition. And there's some now famous singers, sort of the national music of uh, Portugal. And I, I'm going to play some at the end of my talk here, but here's some uh, illustrations of the, uh, the sailor come back from sea, and this is the Portuguese guitar, which is all in harmonic tuning, so it's very easy to play. And then a lady of the day or the night, I'm not sure. So this was considered very low culture compared to the, oh, the stiff formalities of the court and formal 
let's say, classical music. But it goes on to this day as a sort of a, a lamenting kind of a music. I'll play some at the end of my talk here. Uh, meanwhile, the city kept growing because of its trade and its international colonies. And so Portugal being a, you know, let's say, it's a small country to be born in, but there's a great world to live in. So typically the men would go off to sea and to conquest. Uh, this was uh, the center of town right on the Tagus River um, at the height of the empire when they had colonies in Africa to Asia. And then there was this tremendous earthquake which washed out most of the town. 80% of medieval uh, Lisbon was destroyed. Only the ancient Alfama district up the hill, which was where the poor people lived, uh, survived. And so uh, a tsunami came in and washed away almost all the whole town in uh, 1755. Um, there are many sad songs about this, but what it led to was the first modern city planning in Europe, which led to the grid, which is typical of most cities now, where um, the Marquis de Pombal, who was the advisor to the king at the time, laid out the lower, lower reaches with uh, new docks and uh, a grid that goes up, and now you can go walk through that dis district. It's very elegant, and uh, it's called uh, Baja. Uh, this is the front of it, the uh, Praça do Comercio, which faces the river and the old landings for the ships. Now, of course, they have modern shipping elsewhere. But uh, that's King Zhao the first, and then the district, the castle is up on the upper left-hand side. So it's not a very large city, but it has a lot of dramatic points to it. This is the entrance to the great uh, plazas in the uh, uh, Baja area. And uh, these are mostly government offices re originally. Uh, now it's a lot of shops and uh, cafes right there. Um, and then from there, the city goes up uh, three sides up into the hills. So there's always an overlook of this. But it's particularly elegant back when Lisbon was the center of a great empire. So here are some of the upper plazas. So if you haven't been there, uh, Lisbon sort of has all the charm of many a Mediterranean city. But it's fairly compact and um, you always get an overlook if you go up into the higher areas, the alto areas on either side, the castle or the alto on the other side of this center part of, uh, of uh, Lisbon. So it has all the classic buildings. Um, and that's where the proclamation of the Republic, as it still is, the, uh, the royal family uh, is still the Baragas. They have their palace in Cinta, but they, they gave up to a constitutional monarchy um, back in the late 1800s. And so it is a democratic society now, but it still has its remnant nobility, but it has no king anymore. This is the elevator that goes from uh, the lower district up to the Alta. So this is quite a fantastic uh, elevator in the open air elevator. And from above, you see the, uh, the river Taugus. And that's uh, the statue of uh, Pombel, who, who built this new city of the time and, uh, from the, the great earthquake in 1755. So the Marquis de Pombal, he really is the designer of the whole city, in revived this city from a great tragedy of that uh, earthquake. Um, but he was very imperious. He had complete authority over the, uh, in the name of the king, including he um, claimed in the name of the king all of the uh, wine sales out of uh, Porto. And uh, this was so autocratic to all the wine growers in northern Portugal. They had a rebellion, which to this day they call the, the, the rebellion of the drunkards, because all the, the wine growers would get all juiced up and go fight the government forces that came from Lisbon. But that's in the past. Nowadays, you have a lot of other buildings, a lot of modern buildings on the outside. This is the famous um, monastery, Geronimo, which was a high Catholic uh, residency, of course. And now it's been turned into a, uh, a, a museum. And it's right on the River Taugus, just to the west of the downtown. But it has uh, features this, what they call a man, um, manualista style of ornamentation. Very beautiful uh, stone carving and ornamentation of that particular era. Uh, also the Opera House, the Teatro Dona Maria. And you can see the sidewalks, which are characteristic of, of Lisbon, the white and the black uh, tiles, which you'll see everywhere. And now you see them in Brazil. And here's more of the Azuelos, the beautiful carved blue tiles and the settings of painted figures and scenes. Uh, and then there's a popular culture. There's a, again, Port Portugal is a proud nation, with, particularly because it has a, 
a language to itself. And of course, Brazil has become the larger resident of the language, but this is one of the famous poets, Antonio Ribeira. And uh, sort of the difference between the, the low culture and the high culture was quite extreme in Portugal, you could say maybe to this day, but it's a relatively relaxed and happy place, even if it's uh, having its economic troubles now. But here's an example of uh, the, the fine uh, stonework that is on all of the sidewalks all through downtown Lisbon. And in the upper, let's say, more modern districts, you have other uh, uh, sites. This is a large now, a big shopping center called Campo Pequeña, which is an odd name for that big building, but it's actually a shopping center. So this is the map of it. Uh, down here, we will be docking to the, off to the left of the screen. Uh, I'm not sure we'll be within walking distance of the center. That uh, Praça de Comercio uh, is right there on the bottom of the screen, and then the uh, Baixa, it, there's the grid that is in the center, and then the castle is number 11 up there on the, to the right of the downtown, and to so say it all then spreads out all over to, to, to the mountains, and of course Lisbon, like all these traditional cities, has grown exponentially over the centuries to, in this case, go up into the uh, very steep hills, and so if you take one of the tram, electric trams they have up, that's a great way to just sort of see the city and its neighborhoods, um, and uh, appreciate uh, oh, the, the flavor of Portugal here. Uh, the most famous monument, though, in the whole city is the Tower of Belém. Uh, Belém being a Portuguese city, after which the Brazilian city was named. But this was a fortified lighthouse out on a rock in the mouth of the Taugus. Now it's connected by a walkway. But it has famous uh, uh, connotations for the, all of the sailors who left Portugal to go around the world is um, uh, symbolized by this great modern sculpture. And that's the, up on the top here is the prin uh, Principe Infante, the second son of King Jao II, who was, his mother was English, and he had been traveling be uh, between England and Portugal, but he, he felt the destiny of Portugal was to uh, go all over the world and enrich itself by its uh, commerce and conquest. And then he's followed by all of the famous uh, navigators. So this is the, um, the famous uh, explorer's monument right across from where that, uh, the, the, the castle of Tour de Belém is. This is looking back at the uh, Alcantara district, which was just uh, over the hill from the old city. Now it has a lot of modern uh, shipping facilities, including where we will dock, uh, and then neighborhoods above it. And from there, there's this tremendous uh, bridge that uh, is modeled after the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. <coughs> it's the longest in Europe, though, and it uh, it was built to you know, expand the city to the southern bank. But uh, it's named after the uh, Democratic Movement, 18 uh, sorry, April 25th um, in 1979, when Salazar was the di dictator was deposed. Now this is the dock area. We will be docking along in here. I'm not sure which dock it is, but uh, the downtown is up on the far uh, left side of the picture, the classical downtown. The rest of the city, of course, is spread far and wide. And unfortunately, a lot of the neighborhoods have lost their um, residents, and uh, there's a lot of dilapidation in parts of, particularly out of the city center, where people have just moved out or whole areas where had been demolished for factories and things like this. But I uh, just had, going around Lisbon, I'm always collecting, let's say, the folk art of the street. I have no idea what that means, but you can imagine anybody living in that house say, I live at the one with the, what is that? Anyway, uh, that's popular culture these days. Then outside the center of the city, again, you have all these new buildings and the government offices, and so like most European cities, they preserve the center for its historic purposes, but have whole new facilities uh, for the banks and the government outside. And in Lisbon, that goes on for miles and miles out all over the hills surrounding. So again, it's become a, a city like many in Europe where the, um, the most of the people are living outside the city center. And here's the, one of the soccer stadiums um, for the current religion of Portugal. Here's the university. So there's a lot of modern Portugal to see uh, big blocks of this, that, and the other, and then almost competitive uh, modern architecture. Here's a curious uh, neighborhood uh, structures. Um, <clears throat> so if you go out around Lisbon, suddenly you go from the, the most ancient of the town to the most modern. Again, another uh, stadium. 
So this is the current development that you see all over Europe, of course, and everywhere. This is the train station, which is sort of the end of the line of all the European nations to come down to Lisbon. And so the Portuguese government has always been very eager to be you know, international European Union because otherwise they're on the end of the block. And so just recently they had in the 2007 the Lisbon conference that once again reaffirmed European uni unity, once again gave more uh, authority to the European delegations that go to Brussels, and so the the issue goes on. This was at the seminary of, uh, I mean, sorry, the um, monastery of uh, Geronimo again, which they use for a conference center. So I mean, the question of the European Union is beyond my scope here, but just in Portugal, it's very contentious because they've had their economic letdown, and um, these are a sign of uh, uh, we don't let the government um, uh, lead us into a precarious future. You see, no wheels on the bike. And uh, here's the Communist Party saying uh, um, w uh, more um, austerity is not what our country needs. Now this is similar, but Portugal is just above the list from Greece. And here's the national strike for, oh, because the wine got too expensive. Maybe something like that. But anyway, it's a contentious uh, relationship with Europe. And here's a curious graffiti, it says, God is always watching you, and it's the, if, you li if you have the death of the family. If you don't have a good family, it's the, you know, God will be angry. Though it doesn't look like the usual picture of God. And then you have uh, the other side saying, uh, uh, better credit will lead to a happier f uh, future. So this is the current issues in, in Europe. But this bridge is a symbol of modern Lisbon. In Portugal, the uh, Vasco da Gama Bridge just finished about 10 years ago across the Taugus and a whole new area by the train station. So there's a very modern side to Portugal. But overall, the whole city stands the great Corcovado, as in Brazil, but it was built uh, in 1945. They began construction because they wanted to thank the Lord for sparing Portugal of the terrible costs of World War II as a neutral nation at the time. So here it is at night, and as we go in, we may see this, of course. It'll be on the south bank of the Tagus. And so with that, I just uh, leave you the last image from uh, one of the classical buildings. And uh, I'm going to play you, just to finish, uh, a, um, some of the Fado music. But I'll have to uh, get out of this and try something else. Um, bear with me here. I, I think I learned how to do this once upon a time. There we go. So this is uh, Marisa, the most popular singer of Fado now. Thank you for attending the lecture and have a great trip to Portugal. Obrigado.